Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, just uh, to acknowledge Murray's role in this paper too. So this could be relabeled the Murray session a little bit. Okay, so I have one idea. If this is all that you remember from this paper, then that's, you've got a, a central idea. Um, and that is for those of you that actually work with acid indices, which have become more and more popular as people work on demographic and health surveys. The idea is that what these asset indices do is that they look for correlations between different kind of assets that people hold. So uh, the car, the TV, the, um, uh, uh, the, the fridge. And the idea is that what is common to, to those assets, what, what is captured by that correlation, uh, uh, is uh, often referred to as wealth. The problem with this approach is that it breaks down uh, if there is a subgroup within this population and uh, in South Africa and in fact a lot of uh, southern African countries uh, this breaks down in the rural areas where people hold assets, uh, particularly livestock, that are actually not well correlated with the fridges, the cars, uh, the TVs. And that what typically happens is that those assets actually uh, get a negative score on, uh, on these asset indices. And what that does is that we then get uh, people that actually have more stuff, have uh, livestock, um, uh, actually end up rating lower on these scores uh, than people who have nothing at all. So that's the one idea which, uh, which is new. Uh, this is integrated uh, in a sort of bigger argument, and this is a summary of the argument I'm trying to make. So I've already made the point that acid indices uh, can have these anomalies, anomalous rankings, and that, in fact, in our context, what that tends to do is to exaggerate uh, urban-rural differences. What I'll argue is that actually one doesn't have to construct acid indices in the way that uh, this has been done thus far, that we can actually get around this particular problem, and that one of the nice side effects of actually constructing acid indices in a different way is that we can actually give a cardinal interpretation to the indices, which means we can actually use uh, inequality measures on them. I apply this to the South African data, uh, and we'll find that uh, on that measure, asset inequality decreases between 1993 and 2008. So that is quite a different picture from income inequality, which shows that actually income inequality has been fairly uh, um, st uh, static over that, that period. Uh, it turns out that the reason for this difference between the asset or the income view of inequality over this time is that uh, in order to do the comparisons uh, on, on the assets, I effectively have to use the same asset uh, table for the two periods. Uh, so if the holdings of assets increase over time, as I show that they do, the static schedule will then actually definitely show that inequality has gone down, uh, whereas that is not the case in... Uh, uh, with incomes where basically they can continue to rise over the period. And the final point that I want to make in this paper is really that all of these methods of calculating acid indices, whether it's the principal components or the, uh, this new uh, index that, that I'm going to propose, actually have to be very careful when you construct them and actually interrogate them to make sure that uh, the coefficients and the indices make sense. So the automated procedure that is typically used, I, I, I have a problem with. So that's essentially everything that's said up front, so that if I run out of time, you actually already know what, what everything is about. So now I'm going to tell you what I'm actually, how I'm going to go through this. I'm going to give a motivation for why this is interesting to look at. Going to look again a little bit at the standard approach uh, for creating acid indices and think a little bit about what that does when we uh, use it on the typical acid schedules that uh, people use in these uh, surveys, uh, which typically are binary variables, uh, and then 
do that fairly systematically. Um, uh, I will, once I've gone through some uh, sketching out the, the approach, I will apply it to the demographic and health survey data from 1998 and then apply it uh, to, to the uh, cross-time comparisons. Okay, so my motivation for, for looking at this is that acid indices have actually become very widely used in the development literature. And that has been a function mainly of the fact that uh, for a lot of countries we have demographic and health surveys, uh, but we have very poor other kind of information. So a lot of people that want to, to work uh, in the area of development have, uh, have used these uh, indices as a proxy for, for, uh, uh, for incomes. And if you just do uh, searches on Google Scholar, you actually get thousands and thousands of uh, papers that actually have, have, have used these, uh, uh, these DHS wealth indices or uh, indices on, on, on other data sets. Um, so there's been some external uh, validation of the indices. So people have actually looked at, if you have a survey in which you have both acid indices and incomes, how do they stack up against each other? And typically the acid indices do fairly well. But what I will show is that uh, there are actually these internal inconsistencies and anomalies which uh, are actually a little bit uh, troubling. So what's nice about the acid indices, they actually be proved in the empirical work really useful for separating out the poor from the rich. But one big limitation of them is that uh, inequality work has thus far been impossible on them uh, because uh, of the way in which they're created. And it would be nice to be able to say something about inequality uh, in those cases where all that we have uh, are uh, these, uh, these acid indices. Okay, so... The main objective of the paper really is uh, to, to question how these uh, acid indices are created, to argue for an alternative method of doing that, show that this method uh, works, uh, but then to warn that maybe it doesn't work quite as well uh, as one would like. So again, a, a sort of cautious um, a conclusion uh, at the end. Okay, to start off on the uh, literature, the literature really goes back to the Filman Pritchett paper, 2001, uh, which argued that if you only had these uh, asset uh, schedules by simply running a principal component over the schedule, uh, you could extract the first component and whatever is common to these assets uh, should be thought of as wealth. And that intuitive justification uh, got seized on by the people who ran the demographic and health surveys and they actually then put that into them uh, as a default approach for creating a wealth index, which they now release with every demographic and health survey, uh, which is why these things are uh, used so commonly. So just to make it um, clear what these things do, so basically the idea is that we have a set of K uh, assets. We think of them as being generated by a bunch of unobserved factors, A1 through to AK, uh, and uh, in the principal components, the idea is that these are thought to be uncorrelated with each other or orthogonal uh, to each other. Uh, and A1, the first principal component, is really that thing which is underlying these, uh, uh, these uh, assets which explains most of their common, uh, common variants. And uh, that interpretation is why, why people uh, think of it uh, as wealth. Now, one thing which which follows from that sort of latent variable formulation, and there are different versions of it, factor analysis, uh, multiple comp uh, 
uh, MCA. Uh, uh, but, but they all really rely on this idea that, that, that there is a sort of latent common factor that is driving the assets that we, uh, that we see. Uh, the mechanics in which it's done in principal components is you first standardize the variables uh, and then the scoring coefficients come off uh, the correlation matrix as the first uh, eigenvector. And there are a couple of consequences uh, that follow from that way of doing it. The first is that the acid indices are constructed to have a mean of zero and that immediately means that you can't do standard inequality uh, analysis on that because you have these negative values. Um, uh, but in fact, what also follows from that is that um, because you first divide through by the standard deviation, um, that even when people report the scores, that those are actually not the underlying weights uh, on the original uh, assets, which are a combination of the score and uh, uh, and the, 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 the inverse of the standard deviation. But typically, this stuff is never actually reported. And certainly, if you look at the DHS, they don't tell you what, what, these, uh, what the weights are on the assets. Um, and, and that means that you really, it's like a black box, which, uh, which people then, then end up using. So they have been validated, as I mentioned earlier. So Philman and Scott, uh, in a, a 2010 article, uh, looked at uh, how these different uh, scores, uh, acid indices, compare against each other, how they compare to income where you've got per capita expenditure where you've got it. And they basically argue that uh, they sort of pretty much all do the same things. But that's because they were comparing essentially acid indices uh, that come out of the same underlying stable, so whether they're principal components or uh, factor analysis or uh, multiple correspondence analysis. Uh, and they argue that actually, um, typically they think that uh, where this is not that well correlated with the per capita expenditure, uh, it may be actually that, um, that the assets actually picking up longer run uh, well-being, whereas the, the, the per capita is picking up much much shorter run things, and therefore uh, it's not clear that actually this is a problem for the acid index. There have been a bunch of criticisms that have been aimed at these acid indices, mainly because the variables that go into them are, are discrete, uh, and uh, so there's a sort of underlying the categorical structure can, can influence how these uh, um, uh, indices work. Uh, there's questions around whether uh, infrastructure variables should be in there or whether one should just use as, uh, the, the sort of durable goods. But what hasn't been shown uh, thus far is actually that uh, you get these sort of anomalous uh, things which I'm going to talk about uh, in a moment. So before we go on to actually rethinking how one should go about uh, acid indices, I think it's useful to think about what one would want of an acid index. And for me, one of the underlying sort of desirable properties is that you really want, uh, if we've got a vector of acid holdings, so if I have uh, two people and they have K, this one has K assets there, K assets there, if each one of them are bigger than the other. So if I have a TV, this person doesn't, I have a car, that person doesn't, and so on, then my asset score for this holding should be preferably bigger than that one. So that would be uh, the sort of monotonicity requirements. And that, of course, works only if these are goods rather than bads. Um, but that is, in fact, I'll show in a minute, is actually violated uh, by, by some of the current ones. If I think about inequality, it would be nice that somebody has nothing. So if these are all zeros, that that absolute zero actually gets me a score of zero because then I know I can actually do, do some um, construct measures that actually uh, respect uh, the, uh, the sort of 
typical inequality uh, axioms. And typically, I would like a measure which is fairly robust in the sense that uh, it shouldn't be that sensitive uh, whether or not the variables uh, are continuous or, or binary. Okay, so let's start off by thinking if I only had one binary variable uh, and I wanted to do inequality analysis on that, well, that's a little bit of a problem because typically none of the uh, axioms actually work in this uh, case. I can't do a transfer from a richer to a poorer person while keeping their ranks constant. I can't scale everything up. But even though I can't do all of these things, I can still see what happens uh, if I actually plot a Lorentz curve and calculate a Gini on it. Uh, and the Lorentz curve in this case would just look like that. So basically this is the fraction of the population that doesn't have the asset. This is the fraction of the population that does have the asset and the the uh, Lorentz curve would just look like that. And the Gini coefficient, if I measured on that, is just 1 minus P, where P is the fraction of the population that has the uh, assets. So that kind of inequality measure kind of does sort of make sense. So I can apply a Gini to, to this simple uh, binary variable. Um, and uh, that kind of gives me at least some confidence uh, that... Uh, that it, it's not completely stupid to think about uh, uh, inequality in the context uh, of uh, assets, even binary uh, assets. But the moment that I add a second asset to it, uh, I have to start thinking now what happens when uh, I have, let's say I've got a car and a TV, so how do I compare uh, the car and no TV to the TV and no car. I have these four possible outcomes. Uh, and if I wanted to think about an inequality measure on here, I have to think uh, not just how I rate these things, but what happens if I redistribute these things. So if initially I have two people, one who has the TV, one who has the car. I have these same aggregate uh, outcomes if uh, one of the people has nothing and the other person has everything. Uh, and I, I want to somehow penalize that type of redistribution. So I want to make sure that, that basically uh, increasing the concentration of the assets in one, uh, one of the individuals uh, 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 should make my inequality uh, measures go up. I can see what happens if I take this sort of two binary variables and I uh, do a, a principal components index on it. Uh, it. It turns out I can work out precisely what, what the measures are. They turn out to depend on the proportions who hold each of the assets and the proportion that hold both. But one of the things that happens in this case uh, is precisely the possibility. So here I've given you a sort of a possible uh, scatter diagram, bunch of people who have nothing, bunch of people who have both, but most people have one or the other but not both. And in this case, this is a classic case in which if I do a standard principal component, the principal component is going to pick up that negative correlation between these, uh, these assets. Uh, and in fact, what it will do mathematically is it will score one of the assets uh, as being negative. And why does it do that? Well, if you really believe this latent variable approach, which is built into all of these uh, assumptions, the only way it can make sense of that correlation, negative correlation is if it views one of the assets as a bad. So basically, if there's a negative correlation, one of the assets is a good, the other is a bad, and then you will, in this binary case where you have two, two uh, assets only, it's going to score um, somebody who doesn't have the first asset higher uh, than somebody who has both. And somebody who has nothing will score higher than somebody who has, has the asset. And, in fact, we can show cases where somebody who has both assets will score even lower and somebody has nothing. 
And the question is, well, is this just a mathematical curiosity uh, out of thinking about this? And it turns out that, that actually there are cases where this matters. So one of the ways in which, of course, one can think about these, uh, these two assets or three assets or four asset cases is by looking at the literature of multidimensional inequality in indices. But the problem is that that literature really all assumes that the underlying uh, variables are continuous. So they don't really work if you have binary variables. There is one approach uh, by Banerjee, a paper called The Multidimensional Genie, where essentially he thinks of them as continuous variables um, and he he basically is procedure is like a principal components, but instead of standardizing the variables first, he does not do that. He takes the uncentered uh, variables uh, and he divides each variable by its mean. On this principal components, it turns out that actually you can then calculate an index to which you can apply uh, a Gini coefficient. And it turns out that this procedure actually is guaranteed to give you only positive or zero cases uh, and, uh, and in fact you get penalized uh, for uh, concentrating uh, the indices. So that's basically what it, uh, it does. And uh, so applying this uh, Banerjee procedure to, to this typical asset sch schedules, you're actually guaranteed to get an asset index that obeys that principle of monotonicity that has an absolute zero and can be used to calculate a Gini uh, coefficient, even when everything is just binary. Okay, so let's apply that to the DHS. And the first thing to note is that basically if you look at the South African DHS, Implicit in the scores, I backed them out by uh, reverse engineering, regressing them on, on, on the assets. Those scores are strongly negative uh, on, on the livestock variables, which is kind of what, what I was expecting. Um, it turns out that the same thing is true on multiple correspondence and factor analysis if you were to redo it uh, on the DHS uh, wealth index. I'm going to skip through a couple of slides. It turns out that when you uh, use this uncentered version, the Banerjee index, and I calculate genies on the assets in 1998, uh, it turns out that, um, that basically these are what the genies look like, that the, um, that the genie for South Africa 1998 on assets was 0.623, and it goes up from the cities through to, to the rural areas. Um, the other thing just to note, that if we use these, this, uh, unsent, this, this approach to actually just rank the bottom 40%, you actually get more urban poverty uh, than you do on the DHS, and partially it's because the DHS really penalizes the rural as assets. So basically it makes the rural areas look poorer uh, than they do uh, if, you, if you do the, the uncentered version of that principal components. This is the story of South Africa income inequality. We already saw that it didn't shift. Um, but the, if you actually look at what happens to assets over this time, uh, assets have increased, asset holdings across the board have increased. So if you actually now do the Lawrence curves on this asset index, that actually shows a major decrease uh, in inequality. Uh, and that is basically because the asset register is fixed. So there are really two different questions here. So my asset inequality measure really looks at the gap between the haves and have-nots, which has actually decreased uh, on that uh, asset scale, whereas the income and inequality measures really uh, are independent uh, of really that, that sort of very stark have-have-not correspondence. That's it.